Sunday. Uh, God bless you guys. Um, I was just thinking that uh, it's kind of cool with this uh, coronavirus that we still have choices to make. Um, like uh, as I was going to do this video, uh, the first pair of pants I tried on were way too tight and then I tried on another pair of pants and they were tight so I had all these choices to make. And uh, I, I didn't say they were good choices, they were just choices. So we've talked about our dogs before and so I'm going to have an image of them here and um, I can put that up hopefully. And uh, so when you see the dogs, you know, people normally go, ah, which is different than fireworks. Fireworks, which unfortunately may be different this year. When fireworks go off, it's ooh, ah, but a puppy, it's more like, ah. Anyway, so Ollie, uh, the blind dog, the good dog. Uh, Lisa and I go walking and there'll be another image up here in terms of a sidewalk. And so Ollie just doesn't understand or he has no comprehension that as we walk, I'm steering him intentionally away from hitting these metal poles that would uh, injure him, that would anger him, that would set him off. And, um, and I was realizing um, that God does the same thing for you and me, that we have no idea those things that he's keeping us from, those injuries that he's saving us from, those, um, those heartbreaks, those frustrations. And so um, there, there's that saying, you know, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future, uh, which is kind of cool. You can put it on a coffee mug or a t-shirt. But in these days, I mean, that's that's what life is. I'm not quite sure what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And so I have no idea what May and June look like, but I know that we can trust God because he's already there. He knows what the future holds. And so... Um, Lisa's going to push a pause, and, and we have a, um, a surprise guest appearance here. Just one sec. So here's our guest appearance. Here's, here's Ollie. He's really, really a good pup. Beautiful, white, loves us, well-adjusted. And yes, he is blind and he is deaf, but he loves us. He loves us very much. So, um, so let's pray together. Lord, as I'm holding Ollie, I'm just uh, reminded how much you love us. And that you hold us in your arms, Lord Jesus. And though we're often blind and deaf to what's going on around us, you're not. And you love us. You love us so much, Lord Jesus. You gave it all. You paid it all for us. I'm grateful, Jesus. I'm grateful for who you are, what you've done in the past, and what you're still doing today. So we love you, Lord Jesus, and we bless your holy name. Amen? Amen. Let's sing together.
Hey guys, this is Mike from uh, Breakwater. My turn to do the uh, greeting for church. So uh, I'm actually going to try this using a selfie mode, which I usually can't see when I'm outdoors. I just see a reflection on the screen. So here I am holding my own camera, and, which is kind of weird since I uh, record pastor every week on my good camera. But, uh, you know, these cell phones are pretty remarkable. Are you bored yet? Feeling anxious, kind of tired of this whole lockdown situation. My um, radio station uh, acronym I'm sort of using is Keep Busy and Talk to God. KBTG on your radio dial. So I'm keeping pretty busy. Uh, we're working on our business every day, actually. We're uh, trying to network with our business partners and sort of keep things going. Uh, keep the um, balls in the air and keep those relationships we're handling calls. Uh, Kathy's actually done a number of referrals in the last few weeks, so uh, we're kind of encouraged with that. Uh, not everything has dried up, although in the senior living world, uh, people are a little bit leery of uh, making a move like that. You know, with a lot of time on your hands, you, you sort of think about sort of uh, strange things and maybe do strange things with your time. I've been having these strange thoughts uh, about like ping pong and uh, Hollywood squares and welding helmets and alternatives to toilet paper and all these types of things. You ever uh, think about a ping pong table that's nine feet long by five feet wide? 
Social distancing is built into a ping pong table. You can play at either end with your friend and uh, feel uh, that you're uh, operating in a safe mode. And then I was thinking about the old Hollywood squares where uh, they've got all those isolated uh, like little cubicles, little cubes that people sort of reside in. I was imagining a church with nothing but those uh, Hollywood squares types of cubes and the pastor preaching to everybody isolated from one another, sort of a social distancing uh, kind of a situation. The health, welding helmet, that's my PPE. I, I can go to the uh, grocery store and wear my welding helmet and uh, feel pretty secure that nobody's breathing on me with their nasty virus that I know that they have when they're standing next to me. I sure miss you guys all. I miss worshiping with you. I miss seeing you, fellowshipping with you, singing, praying together. It's nice to imagine every weekend that we're all doing it together and looking at uh, Pastor's uh, sermon on the video, and I'm sure that we are all doing that. It's funny, we don't see each other, we don't talk about it, but we know that that's happening. Looking forward to getting back together with you. If you need to talk to somebody, call them on the phone. If you want to help somebody else and just reach out, just call somebody on the phone or send a text. You know, I get a nice little text every morning from Tony, he kind of picks me up and starts my day. I respond to it. Uh, kind of interesting how little things like that can make a difference. So again, I'm looking forward to seeing you guys at church. Uh, be safe, wear your PPE, keep busy, talk to God, and we'll see you at church soon. Hey, greetings, mighty warriors. Welcome to uh, our worship service online. This is uh, Coronavirus Sunday number seven. So we've been uh, seven weeks shut down at the church, but we hope you're enjoying our online videos. Uh, thanks, Mike, for your greetings today. Uh, we really appreciate your leadership on church council and helping make Breakwater become a reality. We so appreciate it. And you and I are getting to know each other very well every week, you know, filming these videos, so I uh, appreciate your, your efforts doing that, too. Uh, thanks also to Brian and the worship team. I never actually see what they do for worship until Sunday morning when I click on the video. But every week I'm blessed by it. I find out it's really creative and, and wonderful. So thank you, worship team, for, for your leadership on these vi videos. Today is a communion Sunday, so I, at the close of the service, we'll be celebrating communion together. I invite you to uh, get some grape juice or wine in your home or get some crackers or bread and have that ready. And then when, uh, when I lead the communion part of the service, invite the members of your household to join you and join with us in that. Also take time to uh, download uh, your, your bulletin uh, from, uh, from the church website. Uh, read the bulletin, that information changes every week. And take time to download your sermon outline so you can follow along uh, on the sermon uh, quite easily. So uh, we'll have a moment of prayer and then we'll get into today's message. But we get some really good news this week. Uh, our friend uh, Pete, Pete Copeland uh, went to the doctor, and uh, uh, the doctor said he's cancer-free. Hallelujah, from stage four to no cancer at all. So we're so grateful for that good news. And Mike, uh, you're hiding behind the mic there, but you've had some, uh, some good news as well. Uh, you and Kathy got a new uh, granddaughter, uh, Genesis Rose Swisshelm born on Good Friday, and what a great name, and that's kind of a new start, a fresh start. Congratulations on a new uh, grandchild. Uh, many of you know Matt and, and Danielle Swisshelm, and congratulations to them. So please, uh, please join me in a moment of prayer, and then we'll get to today's message. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your grace and, and the joy that you fill your servants with as we follow you. And we thank you for good news this week. We're, we're grateful for Pete and the good news that he's experienced and the healing in his life. And we thank you for his leadership on, the, on our elder board at Breakwater Community Church. Bless him and his family, his children and his grandchildren and his wife. Uh, we thank you for him. And we're also grateful for new life in the midst of sad times in our country. Uh, Life rolls on, and we're grateful for Genesis Rose Swisshelm, born on a Good Friday. And congratulations to, to Mike and Kathy and, and Matt and, and, and Danielle. And uh, thank you for the many episodes of good news in our lives. 
Uh, we pray for those who struggle with their health, and particularly we pray for uh, the Hyder family this morning and, and others that are struggling with health issues. Uh, we pray for our president this morning, that you grant him wisdom as he leads our great nation. We pray for our governor. We pray for senators and congressmen and all those that are in positions of authority. And, and bless them, Lord, and grant them wisdom as they lead our nation uh, through uh, the trials of this coronavirus. Finally, we thank you for Jesus Christ, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, the Alpha and the Omega, the author and the finisher of our faith. Thank you, Jesus, for the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hey, Breakwater, how are you guys doing? I am Jonathan Milliner, and unfortunately my wife Allison is unable to be with me today. Um, if you don't know, uh, I spend my days taking care of the Marines over at Camp Pendleton to the best of my ability, especially during this COVID time. Uh, my wife spends some, a lot of her time in Arizona, so she kind of splits her time between Oceanside and, uh, and Arizona. And so she's down there this week working hard. Um, but I've got this memory verse for you this week, and then I'm going to kick it over to her and let her take care of the scripture reading. But let's see, the memory verse this week is coming from 1 Timothy uh chapter 2 verse 3 through 6 and i'm going to try to give you the niv version um today so it starts like this um, this is good and pleases god our savior who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth for there is one god and one mediator between god and mankind the man christ jesus who gave himself as a ransom for all people and this has been witnessed at the proper time. So hopefully that verse uh, blesses you. Uh, it's fantastic to know that we serve a God who wants all people to be saved. Um, so that's a blessing. Um, I wish you guys the absolute best. I hope you're staying healthy, staying COVID free, um, not going crazy in the shelter in place. And uh, hey, the beaches are open. So go out and take a walk. I know I will. I know that I have. And I'll continue to get out there and enjoy some, uh, some sunlight and uh, some outside time, but make sure you keep that mask on and be safe. Protect others, protect yourself. Uh, take care. Um, over to Allison. Hi, Breakwater. This is Allison coming to you from Arizona with this week's reading, which comes from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. And it reads, First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. 
We look forward to getting back to breakwater and getting to see everybody soon. In the meantime, stay safe, stay, stay healthy, and have a very blessed week. Hey, Jonathan and Allison, uh, thank you for doing today's uh, scripture reading and, and memory verse. Uh, Jonathan, I understand you did the uh, memory verse. I haven't actually uh, seen the video yet, but anybody that does a memory verse gets one of these breakwater challenge coins, got an image of the church on the front and an anchor on the back with our, with our mission statements. So, uh, so folks that are online watching, if you want to do this, give Brian a call and get on there and do the memory verse and we'll get you one of these coins as well. Uh, in 1994, I had the opportunity to go to uh, Washington, D.C., along with about uh, 100 other pastors from uh, all over the United States. And it was called the Washington Insight Briefing and it was sponsored by the National Association of Evangelicals. And we spent about a week in our nation's capital, and among other things, we met President Bill Clinton. He actually spent 40 minutes with our with our small group, and then uh, we met some of his staff, and we met five U.S. senators and two or three congressmen, and we met uh, a few state governors. And uh, I think the most impressive person I met that entire week was the chaplain of the United States Senate. Uh, his name was uh, Dr. Richard Halverson, and he came into the meeting room uh, very slowly, walking with a cane, and by the time he got to the podium, uh, we were ready to listen. And Dr. Halverson uh, ran over his allotted time slot. He was cutting into the uh, time allotted to uh, Senator Dan Coates from Indiana, and Chaplain Halverson looked at the back of the room where Senator Coates was standing, and he said, Danny, I, I want to take a little bit of your time because I got a few things I need to say to these people. And so Senator Coates said, the floor is yours, Chaplain. You do as you want. And when Coates later came to the podium himself, he said, Halverson is, uh, is my chaplain. And he said, he's frail in body but he's strong in mind, and he's overflowing in spirit. And that ought to give all of us a pause and, and reflect on things that are really important. Doesn't matter what your age is. Are you overflowing with spirit? Do you love God? Is the spirit of God flowing through your life? And so as Halverson spoke, we listened. And he said three things that really stuck with me. And I could remember them today just like it was yesterday. He said, you evangelical pastors, first of all, he said, you pastors tend to write a lot of letters to senators and, and congressmen. And he said, most of them are angry letters. Most of them are selfish letters. Most of them are single issue letters. He said, very rarely do one of you pastors ever write to one of your representatives or senators and say thank you for all the hard work you're doing for our community and for our nation? And so that stuck with me. I said, wow, I better shape up when I write my letters to my congressman. The second thing uh, Halverson uh, talked about is he says, next year I plan on retiring, 1995, he planned on retiring. And he had announced it to, uh, to the U.S. Senate that uh, they need to begin the search for uh, another chaplain. And he said the senators, every senator from every single state had received letters from pastors in, in, under their constituency, said God was leading them to be the next chaplain of the U.S. Senate. And they would give these letters to Halverson and they'd chuckle and they'd say, I wonder, chaplain, how many... How many people God's actually leading to be the next chaplain of the U.S. Senate? So they would chuckle a little bit about that one, but the point was made, wasn't it? And then the third thing Halverson said, is he said, uh, for two years now, uh, the President of the United States has wanted to have a national prayer breakfast at the White House, but it didn't happen because prominent evangelical leaders refused to show up. They didn't want to be photographed with the President of the United States. And I'm thinking, wow, what a witness uh, we have for the Lord. And sadly, over the last 26 years, I don't think things have changed that much. So in our text,
text today, the uh, elder statesman Paul is writing a letter to uh, Timothy, a young pastor, his protege. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. And as I read those words this week, uh, I, I realized that I'm not praying enough for my elected government officials. And I immediately took out a piece of paper and I wrote down the names of the President of the United States, the Governor of California, and I wrote down the, our, our U.S. Senators from California, and I wrote down my state representative and my state senator, and I took that piece of paper and I put that in the front drawer of my desk where I pay the bills every week, and I'm going to pull that out. And every time I see that sheet of paper, I'm going to remember to pray for those who are in authority. Uh, that, is, that is the heart of what Paul is telling Timothy in our text today. So friends, we're in the midst of a journey through the New Testament. We're reading five chapters a week, uh, and in 52 weeks' time, uh, we will have read all 260 chapters of the New Testament. Each week, I pick something from the five chapters that we've read to preach on, and each week is a memory verse taken from those five chapters. And so this week's readings involve Paul the Apostle's first letter uh, to Timothy. Uh, we read chapters 1 through 5 of, of 1 Timothy. And we invite you to join in. If you're new to our ministries at Breakwater, jump right in and start reading five chapters a week. And it will bless you, I guarantee you. Uh, next week's readings will be 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6 and 2 Timothy chapters 1 through 4. But Paul's letter to Timothy, his first letter, these gentlemen had a long relationship together. As you read the New Testament, uh, we realize that Paul first met Timothy in the midst of his second missionary journey, the journey that took him into the European continent. He met Timothy in the city of Lystra, which is in uh, southern Turkey, and uh, that's where they first encountered each other, Acts chapter 16, verse 1. And they traveled together uh, throughout the Roman Empire for many years. Timothy's name is mentioned 28 times in the New Testament. And you might not realize this, but Paul and Timothy co-authored six of the books that are in the New Testament. So in addition to having two letters addressed to himself, First and Second Timothy, Timothy and Paul uh, wrote together the books of First and Second Thessalonians, Second Corinthians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon. So in the midst of this relationship, somewhere along the line, Paul decided that he was going to appoint Timothy to be the pastor of the church in Ephesus. Uh, 1 Timothy 1, chapter, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 talks about Paul appointing Timothy to be the pastor in Ephesus. And this was a daunting challenge because Ephesus was a rough place uh, to be the pastor. In fact, you might call it uh, the, the charge that Timothy had was to tame the savage wolves that were ravaging uh, the church in Ephesus. You know, welcome to the pastorate, uh, Timothy. So Ephesus was one of the largest cities in the Roman Empire. It had uh, about 250,000 inhabitants at the time of the Apostle Paul, a very large city in those days. And it was the site of one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. It was the site of the great temple of the goddess of fertility, uh, Diana. There was a temple built to her there that uh, is no longer there, but in the day it was four times as large as the Parthenon, which still stands on the top of Mars Hill in the, in the city of Athens. A, a huge place where the goddess of fertility was worshipped. Paul had been to Ephesus at least twice. Uh, Acts net, chapter 19 records his first journey to Ephesus, where he established the church, and he spent two years in the city. 
And during the time he was there, a, a riot broke out, uh, one of the incidents that happened, where there was a silversmith by the name of Demetrius who made his living making little tiny silver shrines in honor of the fertility goddess uh, Diana. But his business was uh, uh, breaking apart because of Paul's preaching. And so a riot broke out, and probably Paul ended up in jail in, in Ephesus. It doesn't say that in Acts chapter 19, but he probably landed in jail, and it's likely that he wrote two of the New Testament books while he was in an Ephesian jail. Uh, Philippians and Philemon. So after his tour of duty in, uh, in Ephesus in Acts chapter 19 uh, on his second missionary journey, Paul later returned uh, to the city uh, on his third missionary journey and his parting words uh, to the elders of Ephesus uh, were, I know after I leave savage wolves will come in and ravage the church. You can see those words in Acts chapter 20, verse 29. After I leave, it's going to be rough in the city of Ephesus. So Paul says to Timothy, here's your church, brother. Uh, take, tame the savage wolves that are ravaging the church there in Ephesus. And so 1 Timothy is a letter uh, from Paul to Timothy to offer advice and encouragement on how to pastor this unruly church that was in the city of Ephesus. And if you open up to 1 Timothy chapter 1, take a look at chapter 1, verse 3. Paul says, as I urged you when I went into Macedonia, stay there in Ephesus so that you may command certain people not to teach false doctrines any longer or devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies. Such things promote controversial speculations rather than advancing God's work, which is by faith. Verse 6, he says, Some have deserted from a pure heart and a good conscience and have turned to meaningless talk. If you go down to verse 18 of chapter 1, he says, Fight the good fight, Timothy. Hold on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected and so have suffered shipwreck with regard to the faith. And then in verse 20, he actually names some names of people that have uh, caused people to fall, caused Christians to fall away from the faith. I think if Paul were here today, writing to Timothy, one of the things he might address would be Christians that spend all day long on Facebook or other social media devices posting controversial political issues or controversial religious issues and just stirring up uh, controversy you know, among the general population that reads these things. I think Paul would say, enough already with this stuff. Let's get your focus back as Christians. Uh, enough of this meaningless talk, this, this endless genealogies. And so uh, he, he addresses this issue with Timothy and then flows into how do we how do we tame these kinds of savage wolves that stir up uh, this kind of controversy that's ravaging the church. And that's what chapter 2 is all about in 1 Timothy. It's worship. How do, we, how do we bring peace and stability to the church, to the society? It's through uh, worship and through proper worship. And as you read through chapter 2, it's divided neatly in half. Uh, verses 1 through 7, proper worship includes correct teaching and correct theology. And then verses 8 through 15, uh, proper worship includes appropriate behavior for men and women who love the Lord Jesus Christ. So this morning we'll take a little bit of time and look at the, the correct theology that the Apostle Paul points out and then the appropriate behavior for those who would be followers of Jesus. So chapter 2, verse 1 again, I urge, first of all, petitions, prayers, intercession, thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and those in authority. And I've already talked about that a little bit. But boy, we are living in a culture where things are so divisive and Christians feed right into it. Democrats don't talk to Republicans. Republicans don't talk to Democrats. It's all cynicism. 
It's all criticism. It's all polarization. And Paul is saying, enough already. When is the last time you prayed for those in authority? You know, and as I hear those words, as your pastor, I'm committed to pray for the President of the United States. You know, that God would give him wisdom to help lead our nation through these trying times. I'm committed to speak, uh, to pray for the Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, that God would continue to bless her and give her courage and strength as she leads the people's chamber of, of, of this great nation of ours. We want to pray for all of our leaders in order that God would bring peace to our nation. First of all, this theological teaching, pray for those who are in authority. That's huge. Let's do it. Let's, uh, let's commit to praying for our leaders. The second uh, thing that the Apostle Paul says that leads to uh, quality theology is part of our memory verse today. Uh, God wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. All people. God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes, whoever, whoever believes in him shall have everlasting. It doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat or whether you're a Republican. It doesn't matter if you're rich or if you're poor. It doesn't matter what the color of your skin is, what your race is, what your religious background is. God wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. God wanted, um, God, God wanted Bob Marley to be saved, that great musician from Jamaica who brought to us some very popular reggae music in, the, in the, the late 70s and the early 80s. And I loved the music of Bob Marley, but I didn't like his theology. Bob Marley was a Rastafarian, and it was a, it was a very immoral a lifestyle that led to heavy drug use and, and, and other things. And Marley actually worshipped Heli Selassie, Heli Selassie, the emperor of Ethiopia, believing that Heli Selassie was the king of kings and the lord of lords and believing that he was from the lion of the, the, lion of the tribe of Judah. But then Halassie died uh, and Bob Marley contracted cancer. And later in his life, Marley accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, the living emperor, as his lord and savior. And Marley's last words, uh, Jesus, take me. He, he, he preferred to be with Jesus than to have any more struggle in this life that he was dealing with his, his cancer issues. And so God loved Bob Marley and wanted Bob Marley to come to the knowledge of the truth. God loved a lady named Diane Lake. She's still alive. Diane Lake uh, was the youngest member of the Charles Manson family, uh, 14 years old, and she came under the influence of Charles Manson, and uh, she thought he was the Messiah. And as Manson uh, began to become more and more abusive, she began to have her doubts, and after those terrible murders in Los Angeles, Sharon Tate and LaBianca, La uh, she realized Manson wasn't the Messiah. And later on, she became a follower of Jesus, recognizing that he was the true Messiah. And Diane Lake uh, ended up uh, having three beautiful children, becoming a special education teacher, and the author of several books. Uh, God wanted Diane Lake uh, to, to come to the knowledge of truth. She, he wanted her to be saved. And God wants you to be saved. No matter where you are in your journey in life, no matter what you have done, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In fact, I'd like to pray for you right now. Maybe God is speaking to your heart and to your soul right now, and you've been trusting things that really aren't going to save you. Uh, join me in prayer. Open up your heart. Lord God, I believe that you love me. I believe that uh, you want me to be saved. I believe that you want me to have a knowledge of the truth. So I ask you, Lord, come into my life. Touch me. Turn me around. Save me. Make me be the kind of person you want me to be. I believe Jesus died on the cross for my sin, rose again from the dead, and destroyed the power of sin and death and hell. Come into my life, Lord Jesus Christ. Let me know the truth. Let me be the man or woman 
you would have me to be. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, talk to somebody. Or you can even email me or send me a, a or give me a telephone call. That information is on our bulletin. Or on our website, we have a button you can push that says prayer. And uh, you can put a prayer request there. And we'll send you some information to get you started on your journey. But these are the truths that, that Paul is teaching Timothy that, that drive away the savage wolves that seek to ravage the church. He says, remember to pray for those who are in authority. And he reminds us of the theological teaching that God wants all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of truth. The third thing theologically that Paul teaches Timothy is in verse 5. He says, there's only one God and one mediator between man and God, uh, the man Jesus Christ. Uh, ancient Jewish uh, theology from 3,500 years ago. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your mind, and with all your soul, and with all your strength. One God and one mediator between man and God. And that mediator is not Heli Selassie. That mediator is not Charles Manson. That mediator is not Republican or Democratic ideology. That mediator is not Buddha, is not Muhammad, is not Joseph Smith, is not the Pope, is not any other individual. It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who went to the cross for us and rose again from the dead. One God, one mediator between, the, between God and, and man, the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is what makes for strong worship is good theology. Remember to pray for those in authority. Remember that God loves you. And remember that there's only one mediator between God and man. So in addition to uh, correct teaching, correct theology for proper worship, proper worship also includes appropriate behavior. And this is what's addressed in verses 8 through 15 of chapter 2. And Paul speaks to men, and he speaks to women. And many of the things that Paul says in these next few verses are culturally conditioned. Uh, they apply uh, to a very specific situation uh, 2,000 years ago. And the specifics may not necessarily apply to us today. But the general principles do. So he begins in verse 8. Uh, he says, Therefore, I want men everywhere to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or disputing. I want men to pray. You know, women tend to be much more spiritual than men. So Paul is saying, I want your men to be individuals of prayer. And the idea of lifting up your hands, you know, this is how they would pray 2,000 years ago. They'd lift up their hands to heaven. Their eyes were open. They'd be, they'd be talking to God this way. That's a cultural specific. We don't have to lift our hands and pray this way uh, like they did 2,000 years ago. Some people enjoy praying with their hands up. Others don't. Today, we tend to pray with our hands folded and our eyes closed and our head bowed. And that, you don't even have to do that. But men are, are required to pray. God wants us to pray. And I'm so blessed by uh, Pastor Tom Fleming and his, his ministry of prayer in our congregation. Tom's been doing it for a long time, and he's encouraged a lot of people by praying for them. He's probably prayed for you over the years. And so, uh, men, this is what the Word says. Develop a prayer life. Begin to, begin to pray. Because men, men tend to get angry when things go wrong. We tend to shake our fist and get furious. This is how we deal with stress. We get angry. But Paul is saying, no, nope. I want you to pray without anger, without disputing. Uh, the James, in chapter 1, verse 20, he says, The wrath of man uh, does not work the righteousness of God. Uh, all of Scripture is teaching us men to learn to control our temper, to learn to control that beast within. Uh, Proverbs, chapter 25, verse 28, says, uh, like a city without walls is a man without self-control. The philosopher Will Rogers once said, people who fly into a rage always come into a bad landing. Uh, 
as many of you know, uh, I enjoy playing golf, and I just heard the golf courses uh, are starting to open up, so it looks like I may be getting out there again. I'm not, I'm not real good at golf, but I love to get out there in the open spaces and the fresh air and, and the exercise. But uh, as you might know, there's a lot of rules in golf, and it takes a while to learn them. One of the rules is you're not supposed to throw your clubs. If you get uh, uh, angry and throw your club, they're going to ask you to leave the golf course. Another one of the rules is you're not to break your club intentionally. And those rules are on the books because there was actually a PGA golfer in the 1950s. His name was Tom Bowl, and he was noted for his furious temper. Every time he'd miss a shot, he'd have, a, he'd have an explosion, and he was often known for throwing his clubs or, or breaking his clubs. In one tournament, uh, he actually missed six putts in a row. Sounds like something I'd do out on the golf course. And he got so angry after missing six putts, he shook his fist at God and said, Why don't you come down here and fight like a man? Well, friends, gentlemen, uh, the wrath of man does not work the righteousness of God. Uh, we are called to learn to control our temper and learn how to have discussions without disputing. That will help uh, calm the savage wolves that seek to ravage the church of Jesus Christ. So Paul addresses men in this section, and then verses 9 to 15, he addresses women. And again, you need to remember many of these things are culturally uh, sensitive. In verse 9, Paul says, I want women to dress modestly. And that's a good principle. And he, verse 10 says, modestly with good deeds. Uh, there's a lot of specifics there. And, and ladies, it's okay to braid your hair. It's okay to wear pearls if you have them or gold. It's okay to have uh, nice clothing. Uh, you know, if Paul were here today, he wouldn't be saying those kinds of things. That those, uh, those issues dealt with something that was going on in Ephesus 6, 000, or 2,000 years ago. And it was that dress code signaled something very different back then than it does now. So, ladies, put on your makeup, look nice. It's, it's okay. to. The idea is dress modestly. The second thing Paul says in verse 11, a woman should learn in quietness in full submission. And that's how all of us should learn. When we want to learn something, keep your mouth shut and, uh, and submit to the teacher, and you're going to learn something that way. Verse 12 says, I do not permit a woman to teach or assume authority over the church. She must be quiet. And again, Paul's addressing something that was going on in, in Ephesus. Apparently, there were a lot of loud and abrasive women that would interrupt the service and, and using their newfound freedom in Christ to create a lot of chaos and gossip and malicious talk in the church. And Paul was saying, be quiet, you know, just learn in submission. You don't need to be talking in the church service. It wasn't meant to be something for all time and, and all eternity. And as you look at Paul's writings, he worked with many wonderful ladies as co-evangelists, co-pastors. Uh, one lady even mentions as an apostle. So the principle is a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. As should a man. We learn in quietness and full submission. And finally, Paul in verse 15 says women should continue in faith and love and holiness with propriety. And uh, even through the trials of childbirth, which is one of the probably one of the most painful experiences for the human condition. Uh, you exercise faith in God and the love of God and, and holiness. And that, that kind of emotional status is going to allow you to get through the pangs of, of childbirth uh, more than a, a, a distempered spirit or a doubting spirit or a hating spirit. So, so this is Paul's message for proper behavior. Men, develop a prayer life. Get the quiet time. Work on those anger issues. Ladies, uh, dress modestly. Uh, learn with quietness and continue in faith, love, and holiness. So this is how you slay the ravaged wolves. Proper worship. Get the theology right. Pray for those who are in authority. Uh, remember God loves you. There's one mediator between God and man. And live it. 
you know, preach the gospel at all times, St. Francis says, if necessary, uh, use words. You know, get rid of your anger. Live a holy life. And that will, that will bless a, a lot of people. So the savage wolf attacking the church today has a name. And it's coronavirus. And this savage wolf uh, brings fear. He brings paranoia. He brings separation uh, between people. But as Christians, we're not going to give up. Even though we're meeting in our homes right now, we're going to continue to worship God with proper theology and, and proper behavior and continue to press on until the doors of this church are open again, the doors of all of our churches in the land. Uh, when, when we start something new, there's always a human tendency for everybody to get all excited uh, at the beginning. You know, and we're doing these videos online now, and there's a lot of excitement. But uh, as something new begins to wear off, the excitement wanes. Don't let it happen. Continue to worship. Continue to watch those videos. Continue to read those five chapters every week. Continue to do the memory verse. Uh, continue to worship God in spirit and truth in your homes. And one day this coronavirus wolf is going to be behind us, far in the rearview mirrors of our lives. And the church of Jesus Christ is going to be strong. These doors are going to open up again. Whenever the governor of California says we can open up, we're going to do it. We're going to have two services when we open. We're going to have one at 9 and one at 11. Tell me which one you'd like to come to. We'll try to keep a little social distancing initially. We're going to try to mount some speakers outside so people can listen to the service outside. We're going to continue to film the service so you can watch it online if you're still a little fearful to come to church. But we're going to continue to worship God, and we're going to come back here with, with all glory and praise and honor for our Lord Jesus Christ. And the wolf will be slain dead behind us as so many other wolves in the past have been. So keep on worshiping, keep on loving, keep on serving, and join me shortly for communion. Please uh, join me in communion today in your homes. Uh, hopefully you have some bread or crackers and, or wine or, or grape juice. And on communion Sundays, we do a very special offering. We do two offerings on communion Sundays. So continue your great giving uh, for, the, for your regular tithe to the church. Uh, we need to still pay our salaries and pay our bills, and we appreciate your gifts that come in every week. But on the first uh, Sunday of the month, on Communion Sundays, we do a second offering that we give away. We give 100% of it away and, uh, to a charitable cause. And this week, uh, this month, we're going to give to a group uh, called Lived Experiences, it's a new group, a 501c3 group, right here in this community, right around the church, uh, the, the uh, Crown Heights area of Oceanside. It's one of the poorest areas in the city of Oceanside. Most of the people are below the poverty level, and a, a lot of people have lost their jobs recently. And so lived experience actually feeds 100 hot meals a day right in these areas around our church, and uh, they do this seven days a week. And what's really neat about this week's uh, Deacon's Fund offering is that uh, the Oceanside Rotary Club is partnering with us. They're going to match dollar for dollar. So every dollar that we give to it, the Rotary is going to add another dollar, so we'll double. Whatever we give will be doubled. So give cheerfully, uh, to, uh, as, as always, to your tithe, but also give uh, cheerfully to the Deacon's Fund. Uh, there's, a, there's a button on our, there's a giving button on our website. You can give to either one there, or you can mail in your gifts to the post office box uh, listed on the bulletin. But uh, it's a joy, it's an honor to celebrate communion with you. I, I can't wait till we can do it in person again whenever that happens. But uh, Jesus was there, an intimate gathering uh, with his closest disciples. It was the night before he died. And we're told to uh, examine ourselves uh, before we take communion. And maybe in your home uh, there's been some difficulty, you know, being in such tight quarters for such a long period of time. Maybe now's the time you need to hug somebody and say, I love you and I'm sorry I said those bad things. Uh, I didn't mean it. And, and get a little forgiveness because that's what communion is all about. And communion is also a time to uh, 
examine our faith. And uh, I'd like to read together with you uh, the Apostles' Creed this morning. Creed means something I believe, credo. And the Apostles' Creed goes back almost 2,000 years uh, through the time of the Apostles. The churches all around the world uh, read this on Communion Sunday. So you can find it in your bulletin. Uh, please join with me as we read the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. If there are words or expressions on that creed you don't understand, uh, feel free to ask somebody, give me a call. Uh, the word Catholic, for example, means universal, a universal church. It includes all the different kinds of denominations. But on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. Lord, we thank you for dying for us on a cross. We thank you that you laid down your life for your sheep. You destroyed the power that Satan and that wolves have over us. You crushed the serpent's head and you rose from the dead. So Lord, as we celebrate today, as we partake of this bread, we do it in your name and in your memory. Amen and amen. Let us eat together. At that same supper, Jesus took the cup and he blessed it. And he said, this cup is the new covenant that is sealed in my blood. In the Old Testament, people had to sacrifice lambs and oxen and pigeons and all kinds of animals to take away their sin. But Jesus came to lay down his life one time for us. His blood on the cross takes away our sin. No more need to sacrifice animals. No more need to punish ourselves, inflict harm upon ourselves, because Jesus paid it all. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus into this world to die for our sins on a cross. Thank you that we are healed by your blood, Lord. You have taken away the sins of the world. In your name we pray, and we drink together. Amen and amen. Hey, Breakwater, it's been good being with you today. Um, make sure you do the readings for next week, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and 2 Timothy uh, verses 1 to 4. The memory verse, 2 Timothy 3. 16 to 17. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. See you next week. Be strong. Be safe.